1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But the believer's body is a member of Christ. How then can we be joined to Christ and joined to sin at the same time? Yet some of the Corinthians at that time saw no harm in visiting the temple of prostitutes. And at that time there were a thousand of them in the temple of Aphrodite and committing fornication. This is much like our generation where there are people who claim to be believers but are comfortable with committing adultery, fornication and sexual immorality, not understanding the grave consequences of these sin. In this passage of scripture I have just read to you, in the 16th verse, Paul the Apostle pens this one statement, Know ye not that he who is joined to a harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. When a man and a woman join their bodies together, much more is happening than what the naked eye can see. Their whole personalities are involved. There is a deep experience of oneness occurring here. And this oneness brings deep and lasting consequences. Now, what do you think happens when you continue to have this experience of creating this bond of oneness with different persons after different persons? Why do you think there is so much sorrow in this world? We were not designed to be living a life bed hopping from one person to another. What many fail to realize is that engaging in sexual relations with someone outside the covenant of marriage carries far greater consequences than the fleeting pleasure they seek in those mere moments. What happens when you sleep with someone? During the act of intercourse, it is not solely a physical experience. Something profound is happening in the spiritual realm, something that most people fail to recognize. There is a genuine spiritual transference taking place between the two individuals involved. As stated in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. In the realm of the spirit, you are uniting yourself with that person, declaring in the spiritual realm, we are one. And yet our society takes fornication and adultery so lightly. Our world paints the picture that you can just change sexual partners as often as you change your clothes from one day to another day to another day. According to God's word and according to God's law, when people sleep with one another, it is not only a physical experience. Yes, the physical experience is undeniable. However, equally, the evidence of spiritual connection is undeniable also. Allow me to illustrate the profound connection that is created when two people engage in a sexual relationship. Consider a woman who works a standard 9 to 5 desk job at an office. Let's say she sits next to the same person for 10 years and they become the best of friends. They have lunch together every single day and spend more time with each other talking and working than they do with their own families. They meet up outside work, celebrate birthdays, and grow closer and closer together. They invest 40 hours a week together and develop a deep friendship over the course of those 10 years. Now, imagine that her work best friend, who has become such an integral part of her life, decides to leave the job and move to another company. As a result, their once close friendship gradually fades. It is likely that she will feel a sense of loss and adjust to the absence of this colleague who meant so much to her. However, compared to the breakup of a boyfriend whom she had been in a sexual relationship with for only one year, 
the emotional struggle is much greater. It may take her years to get over this one-year relationship. She may struggle with depression, experience feelings of grief, loss, rejection, and loneliness. When two individuals engage in sexual intimacy, a profound spiritual connection is established, reaching depths that extend far beyond the physical realm. It is a union that surpasses mere physical pleasure and transcends the boundaries of ordinary human relationships. In that intimate act, something extraordinary occurs, a merging of souls, a mingling of spirits. This spiritual connection goes far beyond the physical sensations and pleasures experienced in the here and now. It delves into the realms of eternity, where time ceases to exist and the constraints of the material world fade away. It is a connection that binds their souls together, weaving an intricate tapestry of shared experiences, emotions, and desires. Fornication establishes a deep spiritual bond between individuals, and this is precisely why breakups can be incredibly agonizing. Have you ever noticed how difficult breakups are? Have you ever wondered why divorces are so profoundly challenging? Even in the context of a casual boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, where fornication has taken place. The pain of a breakup can be excruciating. The reason behind this is the fact that we were not created by our divine creator to engage in promiscuous behavior, hopping from one bed to another and leaving a trail of broken connections in our wake. No, we were designed for a more sacred purpose. Breakups are intensely difficult for both men and women. Because when you sever ties with someone to whom you have intimately bound yourself, it feels like you're bleeding from the depths of your being. You might be inclined to dismiss the significance of a non-marital relationship, thinking that since you didn't exchange vows and say, I do, it wasn't serious. However, that assumption is misguided. When you join yourself to another person, when you form a deep emotional and physical connection, the pain of breaking that bond is excruciating. It cuts deep into your soul, leaving wounds that are slow to heal. The pain of a breakup is unique, like a heavy weight pressing upon your chest, an ever-present companion that accompanies you wherever you go. It's not a pain that can be numbed with a simple painkiller. Rather, it is a pain that lingers, breathes, and intertwines with your very being. The aftermath of a breakup can manifest in various ways, further adding to the emotional turmoil. Social withdrawal is a common response, where individuals isolate themselves from friends and family, retreating into a cocoon of solitude. The pain becomes a barrier, causing them to retreat from social interactions, seeking solace in their own company. Moreover, negative self-talk often takes hold as individuals internalize the failure of their relationship and engage in self-blame. They may question their own worthiness of love, harboring feelings of guilt and self-doubt. The mind becomes a battleground, where insecurities and self-criticism wage war against one's sense of self. When a relationship comes to an end, a profound sense of loss engulfs you, as if a vital part of yourself has been forcibly taken away. And in reality, that is precisely what has transpired. A part of you has been taken away. When two individuals intimately connect, a piece of their essence intertwines. And when the bond is severed, a part of you remains with them, and a part of them remains with you. It's a remarkable phenomenon that defies distance and time. Even if years pass and communication between the two is non-existent, the mere sight of a text message from your ex can send your heart plummeting or racing. The lingering effects of the spiritual connection you once shared are undeniable. You may wonder why this happens, why the emotional aftershocks persist long after the physical separation. You may be wondering why this happens, why the feeling and emotions you have for that person persist long after the physical separation. Where you can be going to sleep at night, and you are thinking about your ex you broke up with five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The reason is simple. You became one flesh. This profound unity transcends the superficial and taps into the very core of your being. It's not a bond that can be easily dismissed or forgotten. 
You may have encountered the adage, time heals everything. But when it comes to matters of the Spirit, time alone cannot mend the wounds. Even after the passing of several years, the aftermath of a breakup can continue to haunt you, leaving a lasting impact on your emotional well-being. Sex does change people. It does. What does the Bible say about our body and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20 The Bible provides us with a clear stance on fornication, adultery, and the significance of honoring our bodies. It beautifully portrays our bodies as temples of Christ, holy sanctuaries deserving of reverence and respect. When individuals engage in bodily sins like fornication and adultery, they are committing acts of sexual immorality, thereby sinning against their own bodies, which are the temples of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.19 it is vital to recognize that we do not possess ownership over ourselves, for we have been purchased at a great price. Therefore, it is crucial that every action we take with our bodies aligns with the will of the one who sacrificially died for us and called us to salvation. Our lives must reflect the gratitude and obedience we owe to him. 1 Corinthians 7.23 Ye are bought with a price, be not ye servants of men. Verse 13. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The opening lines, which may have been slogans and trendy justifications adopted by the Corinthian church, aim to downplay the seriousness of the sins they committed with their bodies. They likened sex to food, suggesting that just as food satisfies hunger, sex satisfies sexual urges. However, the Apostle Paul rejected these comparisons, emphasizing their temporary nature. He sternly warned against belittling the body and undermining its significance in worshiping God. Our bodies serve a greater purpose. They house the Spirit of God and embody the presence of the Most High. It is essential to grasp the profound truth that God dwells within us. Therefore, we cannot align ourselves with those who chant the mantra of, I can do what I like with my body. As children of God, we are called to obedience, not indulgence. We must demonstrate our devotion to God by obeying His commands. If we claim that God is our Lord, then we must prove it through our actions. As Luke 6, 46 states, Why do we call him Lord if we do not do the things he instructs us to do? Obedience is the true mark of our commitment to God and our recognition of his lordship over our lives. Verse 15 and 16, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he who is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Apostle Paul continues to unveil profound insights about the body, shedding light on aspects that believers in the Corinthian church had disregarded and reduced to a mere tool for pleasure. He challenges their understanding of the indwelling of Christ within them and questions their audacity to engage in sacrilegious acts with their bodies. How can Christ reside within them, while they willingly unite themselves with a harlot, an unbeliever, or someone with whom they haven't entered into holy matrimony? His response echoes with firmness, God forbid. Despite being products of a deeply entrenched culture of moral decay, Paul expected the Corinthian believers to have broken free from its grip after surrendering their lives to Christ. He goes even further to inquire if they truly comprehend the spiritual consequences of engaging in intimate relationships with strangers, both men and women. These probing questions challenged the believers to reflect on their actions and the sacredness of their bodies as vessels of the indwelling Christ. Paul's admonishing serves as a wake-up call, urging them to embrace a higher standard of purity and honor the spiritual implications of their choices. Verses 17 and 18 
But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Whosoever has confessed Jesus Christ has become a member of the household of Christ and is joined with him in everything that pertains to eternity. However, if such person continues to fornicate, they do so to sin against their body, which is supposed to be the abode of Christ in them. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? In the penultimate verse, Paul poses a rhetorical question that resonates not only with the Corinthian believers, but also with us, believers of today. He challenges us to ponder and answer this question within our minds, before yielding our bodies to the sins of fornication or adultery. Why do we show such blatant disregard for the sacredness of God's temple? Why do we behave as if we have sole ownership of ourselves and defile the very dwelling place of the Almighty God, our bodies? We live in a world that, for all its advancements and progress, often fails to speak about the insidious and destructive power of lust. Lust, my friends, is a poison that can seep into the very core of your being and ruin your life in but a fleeting moment. In this fast-paced world, we are constantly bombarded with images and temptations that cater to our deepest desires. The culture around us often glorifies indulgence and feeds the flames of our lust. It tells us that satisfaction is just one click away, one moment of weakness, one fleeting pleasure. But let me be clear, my dear friends, that lust does not need years, decades, or even months to take root in your heart and destroy you. It needs but one moment of time. Lust whispers sweet promises of gratification, sweet promises of pleasure, but it is a deceiver. It lures you into a trap that can shackle your soul and consume your life. In the blink of an eye, you can find yourself ensnared, your judgment clouded, and your moral compass shattered. It takes but a brief period of time, a single lapse in judgment, to fall into its grasp. I implore you to understand the gravity of this issue. Lust is not a fleeting desire that can be brushed aside lightly. It is a force that can grip your heart, mind, and soul with a vice-like grip. Once it takes hold, it can lead you down a treacherous path filled with regret, shame, and sorrow. It can ruin your life in just a moment, leaving you with scars that may last a lifetime. Don't make the mistake of believing that you are immune to lust. You are not. Greater men and women than you and I have been destroyed by lust. Men who wrote the Bible have been ensnared by lust. You are not immune to it, not at all. You see, lust is patient. It is patient. Out of all the sins in the world, there is no sin quite as patient as lust. It can lie dormant for years and it can lull you into a false sense of security. It can lure you into a false sense of self-righteousness and holiness. And it waits. It waits for years and even decades, and then, once the opportunity for it to present itself arises, it strikes. Lust is patient. Lust is patient. Consider the lives of those who have given in to the seductive call of lust. They may have once been filled with dreams, aspirations, and the potential for greatness. Yet, in a moment of weakness, they allowed their desires to overcome their better judgment. They traded their dignity, their future, and self-respect for a fleeting pleasure only to find themselves trapped in a cycle of addiction and despair. Imagine the man or woman you could have become if it weren't for lust. Contemplate what you could have achieved in life if it weren't for lust. Some people spend hours on their phones and screens watching unholy videos on the internet, squandering their lives away. They do not realize how different their lives could be if they dedicated that time to productive pursuits. Instead, they indulge in immoral videos online. Some of you may struggle with a porn addiction, and you might be sneaking around to feed this addiction. You sneak around your own homes, fearing that your spouse will discover your secret. Some individuals even drive endless miles to places they should not be going to because of lust. They have no comprehension of how much better their lives could be if they focused on self-improvement instead of wasting their precious time on fornication and adultery. Do not underestimate the power of lust to destroy relationships, 
careers, and dreams. It can lead to infidelity, broken families, shattered trust, and lost opportunities. It can strip away your self-worth and leave you feeling empty and hollow. Is the fleeting pleasure of a moment worth the lifetime of regret that may follow? We find ourselves living in an age of tremendous temptation, an age where the relentless bombardment of lustful desires is all around us. Never before in the history of humanity have we been exposed to such a staggering array of options and opportunities to fulfill our lustful desires. Everywhere we turn, there it is. Temptation knocking at the door of our hearts and minds. It beckons to us in the shadows, promising momentary pleasures that often lead to enduring pain. In this digital era, we are constantly bombarded with images and messages that appeal to our most base desires. The internet, with its vast expanse, provides an endless supply of explicit content that seeks to captivate and ensnare our souls. It is a treacherous sea, my friends, one that can drown us in a tide of temptation if we are not vigilant. Romans 7 verse 18 to 20 For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I know some people will find it hard to reason out that their flesh is an enemy to them. Let me quickly tell us this bare truth as we trust the Lord to open our understanding to the mysteries of his word again. Satan is indeed your enemy, but I would like to highlight that your flesh is also your enemy. There are many things we ascribe to the devil that are not true of him. Some people will turn it over to the devil when they commit certain sins. Demons and the devil do indeed compel and push people and urge people to sin. I am not saying for a split second that they do not. They do. But you need to know that the flesh you live in is corrupted and it is in its nature to sin. When you were born again, your spirit is what is regenerated. Your spirit is what is born of God, not your flesh. Galatians 5 verse 19 to 21 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There is an enemy close to you, and that enemy is your flesh. The flesh wants to commit adultery. The flesh wants to tell lies. The flesh wants to covet because it feels good. The flesh wants to kill because it feeds on revenge and lack of forgiveness. The flesh wants to build up idols. The flesh wants to have it all. The flesh is all about self-centeredness. The flesh is all about self-gratification. The flesh is all about self-righteousness. These are the works of the flesh. I'm sure everyone will agree with the fact that if there is an enemy around, then a battle is inevitable. The reason the battle against your flesh is a serious one is that you cannot run away from it or do without it. You cannot run away from the battle with the flesh. Daily, 
you will have to put off the old man and put on the new man. The flesh always wants sin. The flesh does not relate to God. The flesh enjoys the pleasures of sin. This is why the Bible instructs us to walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Today, you will discover how your flesh became an enemy to you the role it plays in assisting the devil to attack you, and how to become victorious in your battle against the flesh. Man is a three-component being. He has the spirit, the soul, and the flesh, which is his body. At the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the spirit of man which relates directly with God died, and that is the reason everyone born of a woman is spiritually depraved and having no understanding of spiritual things. The moment mankind died in the spirit, his soul and his flesh became rebellious against the spirit of God. Now, the moment you give your life to Christ, your spirit gains connection back to God, but your flesh isn't born again. It is the responsibility of God to get your spirit connected back to Him when you give your life to Christ. But it is your responsibility to keep putting your body under subjection, compelling it to obey the laws of God. This is where the battle begins. Your flesh has a demand, and its demand is against the law of God. Romans 8 verse 5 to 9 Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. As far as the flesh is concerned, all it wants is pleasure. It lacks the ability to do what is good, or to do the biddings of the Spirit. That was the reason Paul lamented in our anchor scripture that the good he desired to do, he could not do, but the evil which he did not want to practice, he finds himself getting involved in it. In all of these, Paul never mentioned the devil, but his flesh. What the devil does is to take advantage of the vulnerability of our flesh against us. For instance, when you are hungry, hunger as we know is an appetite of the flesh. The devil could take advantage of that hunger as he tried to Jesus by asking him to turn stones to bread. Another instance is that the devil can take advantage of your sexual desires if you do not keep it under control to allure you into fornication or adultery. Do you now see that our flesh is what opens the gate for the devil to come freely into our lives? The fact that you have given your life to Christ does not mean that your flesh has been subdued. It takes a conscious and deliberate effort on the part of believers to keep putting their bodies under control. Otherwise it would lead them astray. If being born again solves the problem of the flesh automatically, then you wouldn't be tempted to sin. 
Neither will there be anything called carnal Christians, like those Paul lamented about in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Romans 12 verse 1 teaches us what we must do to overcome this innate enemy called the flesh. It reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, you see Paul admonishing us to take responsibility for our flesh. If we will ever win our battle against the flesh, we must offer it as a living sacrifice to God. God sacrificed his only son, Jesus Christ, to save our spirit. Then we have to sacrifice our flesh to please God. There is no other remedy for your flesh than to crucify it. You must learn to discipline your body, otherwise it would get you into serious trouble. Do not give in to its sinful desires. Finally, Galatians 5 verse 16 reads, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verses 19 to 21 of the same chapter lists the different manifestations and works of the flesh, such as fornication, witchcraft, murder, envy, and the likes. So we see that these things are not caused by the devil, but they are products of the flesh. But the way to get out of this thing and be free from the slavery of the flesh is to walk in the spirit. By doing so, we will not fulfill the laws of the flesh. Walking in the spirit entails doing things that edifies your spirit and walking closely with the Holy Spirit. After giving your life to Christ, the next thing for you to do is to allow the Holy Spirit to enter into your life and start working. When the Holy Spirit starts to work, the works of the flesh will disappear and the fruit of the Holy Spirit will start to appear in your life every day. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. The fruits of the Spirit are what will help us against the manifestation of the flesh. The Holy Spirit will help us to kill the power of the flesh. This is the fight we need to fight and stop thinking the common sins of man are the manifestation of demons. This is what the devil wants us to think, so that we can be fighting another thing while the real problem remains and then cause more problems. The flesh must be destroyed to stop it from manifesting.